Okay. So hello, everyone. My name is Ekaterina Mojaeva, and I am a member of the Friends of Korea Board of Directors. I'm excited to be hosting the third webinar in the Friends of Korea webinar series. Uh, we're really happy to have you all with us. I would like to start off by introducing today's speakers, Troy Sangaron and Juni Kim of the Korea Economic Institute, or KEI. Troy is the Senior Director and Fellow at KEI, and Juni is the Senior Manager for Operations and Technology. KEI is a US think tank and public outreach organization, um, which is dedicated to helping the US public understand the breadth and importance of US relations with the Republic of Korea. So KEI's outreach focuses on publications, social media, programs, and public events that help inform policymakers and the American public of the security, economic, and political issues surrounding the Korean Peninsula. So in 2020, KEI published its first annual report on American attitudes toward the Korean Peninsula. And Troy and Juni are joining us today to discuss this report and its findings. So they will start off with a short presentation before we start a moderated discussion. If you have any questions, please kindly leave them in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And with that, uh, let's begin. So Troy and Juni, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Ekaterina, and thanks to everyone for coming and uh, Jenna Gibson for inviting us. Um, we're excited to be here. Um, as Ekaterina mentioned, this is our first annual survey. Um, there's often surveys done in South Korea that look at sort of South Korean opinion towards the United States on various issues or other countries in the region. And there is, I should acknowledge, some survey work done in the U.S. The Council on Global Affairs in Chicago um, does work on this, but it tends to be done sort of looking at the security alliance and we wanted to look at other issues as well. So what we're going to do is kind of quickly take you through some of the main highlights from the survey. Um, we have broad questions, which Juni will start off with uh, talking about looking at sort of how South Korea is viewed in general by the United States, how it sort of stacks up with other US allies or potential adversaries, same for North Korea. Then I'll look at a little bit at the economic relationship and the Security Alliance, and then Juni will turn specifically to North Korea. Um, so with that, uh, Juni, would you like to go ahead? All right, thank you, Troy. Yeah, and just to echo what, what Troy had mentioned, um, thank you to all of you at, at Friends of Korea. I mean, uh, KEI and K Friends of Korea have been great partnerships in the, in the past, and so we're happy to do this presentation. And also uh, thanks to our former colleague, Jennifer, for inviting us to do this as well. Um, so like Troy mentioned, uh, one thing that we did look at was the American general view on South and North Korea. Um, and just as a uh, kind of a caveat to all this, this is just a small snippet of all the, research, uh, the results that we had from our survey. So um, if you have questions after this or would like to know more, uh, just feel free to ask in the Q&A. And we also have more information on our website as well. Um, so uh, we found that uh, half of all Americans view South Korea as a friend of the U.S. and like to see the two countries cooperate more and coordinate more on issues of international peacekeeping, uh, global health, trade rules, and technology and infrastructure. While on the other hand, North Korea is considered the third most critical foreign policy challenge to the U.S., with only one in ten Americans having a favorable opinion of the nation. To move on to the next slide here. So uh, four in 10 see South Korea as a very or fairly influential nation in the world. Um, and the US is viewed as the most influ influential nation in the world. Uh, one uh, caveat to this is that for most of these uh, survey results, about 10 to 18% of survey respondents uh, were unsure. So that even though uh, there's not a majority of people that, that saw South Korea as very or, fa uh, very or fairly influential, um, there's still a large amount of People, uh, people that took the survey that answered that they weren't sure about that. And you can see here that South Korea is um, in between Canada and India on this chart. And uh, for the country list that we have here, we try to make this consistent throughout the survey so that we, if we ask a certain question that involved a number of different countries or regions, uh, we try to make that, keep that as the same list throughout it, uh, the survey. So on to the next slide here. Um, half of Americans view South Korea as a friend to the U.S., uh, but as I mentioned previously, uh, there's a lot of survey sort of response here that marked unsure. And so you can see in the middle part of this chart here uh, that South Korea, um, there's 40% of people that marked unsure. So when you look at just the people that saw that South Korea as a friend or an adversary, you can see that it leans very positively 
um, in terms of people that view South Korea as a friend. Uh, and conversely, if you look down to North Korea, um, only 3% saw North Korea as a friend. And uh, of all the nations included on our, on our list here, uh, they were the ones that were marked the highest in terms of uh, people that saw North Korea as an adversary, even higher than China and Russia. And following on that uh, question, um, when we asked the question of what, what country represents the most critical foreign policy challenge to the US, uh, North Korea marked number three in terms of uh, people that were uh, marked this country as one of the top three critical policy threat, foreign policy threats to the US, just behind China and Russia. Um, and the interesting in, in uh, this analysis as well is that we, uh, when you break down the results by uh, political preference, so if, if someone identified as a Democrat or Republican, um, there was a large partisan uh, split between the different answers that we had. So that uh, typically uh, Democrats saw uh, Russia as a, as a greater threat than, than uh, Republicans did. And conversely, uh, Republicans are more likely to see China as the greater threat compared to Russia. Um, something to keep in mind that, that these survey results were collected in August of last year. So in the months since then, especially with the new administration in office, uh, some of those views may have shifted and, and something we plan to do is this survey is going to be iterative so that we're planning on doing future uh, future survey results later on so that we can kind of track to see how some of these have changed over time. Okay, so 54% of Americans say South Korea handled the COVID-19 crisis very well or well, and this trails only Canada, Japan, and Australia in their perceived handling of the virus. And obviously, um, this was since this was taken in August, the, the situation was a little bit different then compared to now, but even then you can see that South Korea has, was seen as a very had a very favorable view by Americans in terms of how they handle that crisis. And that um, only increased for those that, uh, when you look at just the survey results for those that follow international news, um, you can see that among people that follow the national news that 70% said that they believe that South Korea handled the COVID-19 crisis well, uh, compared to the US where only about a third thought that the US handled it well. So moving on to the overall opinion of South Korea for Americans, two and three Americans have a favorable view of South Korea. And you can see in this first bar chart here, that's this is our overall nationally representative sample um, that 66% had a favorable view of South Korea. And there was actually a significant amount of people that said not sure at 23%. Uh, but you see that uh, not sure category shrink by, by going up here to people that follow international news and even more so for people that follow APAC or Asia Pacific news specifically. And um, only to South Korea's favor that you can see that more and more people, depending on how closely they follow uh, international or Asia Pacific issues uh, that they favor South Korea. Okay, and uh, again, this says the current US administration, but that referred to the current US administration at the time of August. So it's not talking about right now, uh, but. But back in August, 37% of Americans approve of the US administration's handling of relations with South Korea, with four in 10 being unsure. And you can see even in this nationally representative sample that the unsure category even is greater than that of those that approve or disapprove. Uh, but again, for those that more, follow the issues a little bit more closely, you can see that not sure category shrink and that more people actually thought the administration was, they approved of the administration's handling compared to, to disapproving. Um, and we'll see in, I believe, the next slide here. Oh, it's a slide after that. Sorry about that. Um, for the overall pain of North Korea, that most Americans had a favor, an unfavorable view of North Korea. Um, you can see for the nationally representative sample, it's 7 out of 10, 71%. And again, for those that follow the issue more closely, uh, it goes up to 87% for those that follow Asia Pacific news. Okay, so yeah, so this for this one is about uh, approval of the current US administration's handling of relations with North Korea. Uh, most people, uh, well, more more people disapproved than approved of the of the then Trump administration's handling of North Korea, um, with only nine percent of Democrats approving of the current of the Trump administration's handling of relations with North Korea. And you can see for those that follow the issue more closely that that not sure gap shrinks more and that more 
and you see more and more people actually disapproving as, as compared to approving. Okay, and with that, Troy, I'll take it over to you. Thank you, Judy. And just to add a little bit uh, to what you had said, you know, one of the interesting things, because we are able to sort the data by, um, for example, people who voted for President Trump or people who voted for uh, Hillary Clinton at the time. And when you look at North Korea, views tend to almost exactly line up between whether you voted for Trump or Clinton. And so there's kind of a mirror imaging on the North Korea side. You get more uh, agreement on South Korea, but on North Korea, it tends to be very politicized. Um, but we wanted to take and you know look at the economic relationship, and so the trade relationship, and then sort of how South Korea, from an economic perspective, you know what its soft or cultural power is in the U.S. And so basically, two and three Americans see trade with uh, South Korea as beneficial to the U.S. Now. One of the things I think to keep in mind here is that while publicly we often hear that trade is very unpopular, in reality, if you poll Americans, whether it be about with South Korea um, or free trade in general, there tends to be consistent approval for free trade. Um, it actually grew during President Trump's term in office, if you look at surveys done by uh, Pew. And interestingly, if you go back to about a year or two before President Obama, um, Democrats as a majority have approved of uh, trade with other countries and free trade specifically. And so what you really see oftentimes in the public debate over free trade isn't necessarily what the broader American public thinks, but what interest groups within the two parties are actually thinking. Um, Juni, uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that we wanted to get at, and this I started at KEI back uh, when we started negotiating the course FTA, so about 15 years ago. And you know, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, you know, discussion in Washington, DC about uh, free trade agreements. And you know, at the time, you know, people would ask me like what the American public would think about the FTA. And I would often tell people that, you know, I'd be surprised if 5% of Americans knew we were negotiating a free trade agreement with South Korea, um, just because, you know. Free trade agreements, especially with countries like South Korea, tend to be sort of niche policy issues. If we're really being honest, um, you know, something with China or um, Mexico and Canada would be uh, much more well known by the American public, and we can kind of see this reflected in the survey here. Um, interestingly, though, um, while you can see that you know seventy percent of Americans, uh, you know, believe we have a free trade agreement with Canada, and almost sixty percent think we do with Mexico. And South Korea is only, you know, about 27%. We actually included uh, countries that the United States doesn't have uh, free trade agreements with in the survey to sort of see if people would pick countries that we don't. And there's actually fairly strong support for the belief that we had free trade agreements with other countries that we don't actually have ones with. And so I think part of that is that there is a general lack of real awareness, I think, in general amongst the American public for the specifics of the free trade agreements that the United States has. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. Um, so we asked though, just generally, you know, what are the views uh, on trade with South Korea and the United States? Generally, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, you know, most people believe that having trade with South Korea is beneficial to the United States. Um, there is a degree when you uh, just ask the national representative sample who are not sure. Um, but if you look at the people who do not believe uh, we have or we benefit from trade with South Korea, it tends to be a very small percent, you know, less than 10% in all three groups, uh, be it the national representative sample, the international news followers, or those who follow the Asia Pacific region uh, more specifically. Uh, next slide, please, Jenny. So, as I mentioned, we wanted to see you know, how well aware people were of South Korean brands. And, you know, part of this is kind of to get into the idea of what type of soft power does South Korea have? So if you ask Americans, we wanted to put companies that weren't South Korean, uh, so that way, you know, you could get a better feel. Um, you know, Americans are fairly knowledgeable of, you know, all of these major electronic brands. But if you ask them if they are South Korean, um, 
essentially only a quarter of Americans realize that um, only a quarter of Americans realize that Samsung is a South Korean brand. Um, only about a quarter also realize that LG is a South Korean brand. So you know, there's not a good deal of brand awareness uh, for South Korean products. Um, we, to, for the purpose of tonight, we kind of wanted to narrow this down a little bit, but we surveyed other areas. And you know, if you look at Hyundai and Kia, there is a larger percentage. I want to say they're in the like mid 40s who realize that they are Korean. So it is better on the automotive side. But generally speaking, what we found is that most Americans don't realize the major products are South Korean that are actually produced and designed there. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. So we also wanted to look at the cultural side. And so we asked, you know, over the last year, have you watched either, you know, Parasite, which uh, had won the Academy Award for Best Picture? Have you listened to BTS, um, you know, Blackpink or something? And what we found is, is that while K-pop and K-dramas are growing strongly in appeal in the United States, it's still amongst a relatively small group of Americans. Most Americans are not watching or consuming these products, um, which is interesting in a way because, um, you know, we took this survey at the end of August. Uh, many Americans have been, you know, locked down for the pandemic. You know, use of Netflix and other streaming services has soared, and there is a very strong presence of K dramas uh, on Netflix. So. You know, I think it'll be interesting because we want to try and do this over the years to see how this changes. And I think in some ways, um, these types of things in terms of like soft power and looking at how much uh, culture items are consumed tends to uh, be a lagging indicator. Um, so I'll be interested to see if these types of things change as we go forward. But right now it looks like it's still a relatively uh, niche market in uh, the United States for Korean cultural products. Uh, next slide, Judy. So now I'm going to turn briefly to our military alliance with South Korea. Um, here, you know, six in ten Americans see the alliance as beneficial to the U.S. Um, a majority of Americans want to see us maintain or increase our troops on the peninsula. Um, so, Juni, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. And so, you know, here is when you look at the question of, you know, is the alliance beneficial or in the interest of U.S. national security? Um, you know, like I said, 62% of Americans believe it is. 80% who follow international news do, 82% uh, do as well. Um, this is interesting, not because this is different. Um, this is one of the questions the Chicago Council answers uh, or asks on a relatively frequent basis, especially since there were questions about whether we might withdraw some or all troops from South Korea under the previous administration if South Korea didn't significantly increase um, its contributions financially to the alliance. And if you ask Americans specifically about South Korea, there tends to be strong support both in our survey and the Chicago Council survey for having troops there and seeing them as in the United States interests. Um, the reason also I raise this other than uh, the concerns of the last few years about whether troops have been withdrawn is there are some surveys out there that ask Americans, generally speaking, do you believe uh, the US should, for example, perhaps uh, withdraw troops so that they have too many troops abroad? And you do tend to see, if asked sort of that way, support uh, for bringing troops home. Um, and that is often sometimes used to justify why the US should withdraw troops from South Korea. Um, but I would be leery of basing something off of that because you know, one of the things that I learned early on, I did a fellowship at the Asan Institute um, and they do polling on a regular basis. And I was talking to them then, then about uh, how you design questions and everything. And one of the things they talked about is being very cognizant of writing questions that don't try to take and push someone into a specific answer or hint at what you're looking for. Um, we try not to do that. I, you know, hopefully we worked with YouGov on this. So uh, they helped us to try and make sure the questions were as neutral as possible. So hopefully we succeeded as best as we could. But I think if you want to know what Americans think about troops in South Korea, um, we need to ask about South Korea, not generally around the world, because I think Americans also probably have differing opinions on whether troops should be maybe still in Afghanistan, for example, or Iraq, as opposed to, you know, maybe places like South Korea, where they maybe see it as being both calm and having a broader purpose. 
So I'm a little leery of general surveys and then drawing specific conclusions uh, about that. And you might see that in some other survey data that is out there. Um, next slide, please, Shuni. So if we ask about the current view about the military alliance, because we wanted to see, because we had this question about, you know, do you think we should withdraw troops? And so we asked basically, you know, should we maintain all alliances as they are? Should we maintain them, but reform them? Uh, maintain some, maybe have some reform, maybe end some. Um, should we just end all of our alliances and withdraw from the rest of the world? And generally what you see is that, I think looking at the data, there is some sense amongst Americans that we do perhaps need to look at reforming or slightly altering our alliances that maybe they shouldn't be static. But uh, you also can see that, you know, in terms of ending all alliances, basically no one wants to do that. Um, there might be some uncertainty about what we should do, but I think there's a general broader thrust we can look at here that, you know, Americans do view alliances as important. And, you know, Democrats in America generally want to keep the alliances as they are. Uh, Republicans, this isn't surprising because oftentimes, you know, you tend to mirror what your party's leader is thinking, you know, wanted to maintain them, but wanted reforms. Um, so that kind of fall, fell along the political lines, how one might expect. But in a general sense, I think Americans are in favor of maintaining our alliance structure um, in a broad sense. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. So specifically on US troops in Korea, uh, we wanted to see, you know, what people thought about that. And, you know, we tried to give people context uh, before the question about how many troops are in other parts of the world. And in essence, you can see most Americans are supportive of maintaining troops in South Korea. And once again, that tends to grow with the more information that you have uh, based on the types of news you follow. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. All right, I'll turn it back to you, Jenny. Okay, so for this last section, we looked at American views on North Korea and some of the more specific policy points there. Um, and it's interesting because early on, earlier, earlier on the survey, we, when we were asking about general approval or disapproval of the then Trump administration's handling of North Korea, it's expectedly a very partisan response. But when we asked specifically about certain policy, we actually see broad bipartisan support um, as mentions here that 84% of all Americans think that it's important for North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons. And when we even look at the partisan divide of that, we'll see that's actually very strong on both sides. So on that note, um, so uh, for here, uh, when asked about the importance of, of North Korea giving up its military nuclear capabilities, uh, you can see that a very large majority of Americans and actually most Americans think that it's very important for North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons and that that's true for both Republicans and Democrats. Republicans at 88% and Democrats at 86%. And then for those that follow the news more closely, you can see that goes up even more so. And as a follow-up to that, we actually asked a question of what countries uh, should be able to maintain their military and nuclear capabilities. And the largest answer was actually none of them, that 47% of Americans thought that no one should have military nuclear capabilities. And then the biggest answer to that was the US at 42%. Um, and then North Korea is one of the lower countries on the list at 10%. Um, and so that for actually a large part, a large amount of Americans do believe, believe that no country should have access to military weapons. Okay, so, um, and on the issue of North Korean human rights, uh, we also saw broad bipartisan support on this issue as well, uh, that 83% of Americans overall uh, believe that it is very important or very important or important to, to push the, the human rights issue in North Korea. And that that was uh, seen both across re Republicans and Democrats, Republicans at 85%, Democrats at 88% uh, for believing that this is an important issue. And again, for those that follow the news more closely, that's something that just increased. Uh, so with something like uh, humanitarian assistance to North Korea, this is something that we saw a, a little bit more of a divide in regards to uh, Democrat Republican support. Um, about a little over half of all Americans approve of the U.S. sending humanitarian assistance to North Korea. But again, if you notice here that there's actually a very large um, percentage of people that marked not sure. Um, and in terms of the partisan split, uh, there's more Democrats at 
that uh, approve of sending humanitarian assistance compared to Republicans at 50%. And we have a follow-up question here specifically about providing COVID-19 assistance to North Korea. Uh, the numbers here are very similar to uh, the previous question about humanitarian assistance. Uh, the numbers overall for approval are a tiny bit lower overall, but you can see um, that even though there's still a large number of people that marked unsure that more Americans approve than disapprove of the idea. All right, so that covers it for our slides. So uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them here, but you can also go to our website where we have uh, our report fully available online. So you're welcome to check that out as well. One interesting note, uh, just before we turn to questions on the COVID-19 assistance is that um, actually a majority of Democrats and Republicans, just a small, I think it was like 51, 52% support COVID-19 assistance to North Korea. It's actually a weakness among independents uh, that actually brings it below 50%. Interesting. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. So uh, just as a reminder for our participants, if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. That's the little bubble at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, but I will start off with a few questions um, that I prepared for this. Uh, and then uh, please, again, for everyone who is attending, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, our first question is, uh, you, uh, you started this report during the, uh, in 2020, uh, which is not a typical year given the COVID-19 situation and the pandemic, um, especially, uh, so in, especially because the news uh, coverage of Asia has varied a lot during that time as well. So how do you think the results might have been affected, if at all, by the context of COVID-19 and 2020? If you were to run the survey again, do you think your results would be different? So our hope is to do the second annual survey um, roughly the same time next year. So it would again be late August uh, when we would put it out on the field. Um, it'll be interesting. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't really thought about this question just because while well, we had a few COVID specific questions in there because we wanted to see sort of how you know people well because south korea had in the press gotten gotten a lot of uh, support and praise for its efforts in handling COVID 19 we wanted to kind of see if that was really you know seeping through to the general public and if they uh, felt the same way based on what they were seeing and we wanted to ask questions like you know should we actually help north korea through this crisis um, so we had it in mind um i would say you know having looked at some of the like Chicago Council surveys on the questions about, um, you know, support for U.S. troops in South Korea. Uh, those numbers were fairly consistent. Um, so my initial instinct would be that uh, if there was any impact, it was probably minor. Uh, but, you know, practically speaking, the second version of this will take place when hopefully a large portion, but not all the United States will be vaccinated. This will still be an issue around the rest of the world. So I think, you know, if there is going to be um, any you know, differences that come out because of the pandemic and not being the pandemic, we might not see those for another two or three years. Okay. Um, actually, one thing I noticed while um, watching your presentation is that the results from the representative national pool of applicants was not you know, that different from people who follow the news or who follow um, a, you know, Asia Pacific news very actively. I mean, there was some discrepancy, but overall, I think the trends were very similar among all three of the groups. Uh, why do you think that is? And what kind of implication does that have for, you know, public outreach and public diplomacy when it comes to Korea? Do you want to maybe try to take this point, Judy? Sure, yeah. So one thing that we were cognizant of when we were designing the surveys, like, like Troy had mentioned, uh, we didn't want to necessarily lead the questions with uh, you know, that we were kind of expecting a certain answer out of survey response. So we were careful to be very neutral. But at the same time, some of these questions are a little bit niche, like Troy mentioned about the FTA. And so we want to educate um, the uh, survey takers at least a little bit. Uh, but at least for those that follow the news more closely, you could see that we had large amounts of people that had not sure from the nationally representative view, 
But when you go up that ladder for those that followed the international news and those that followed Asia Pacific news, that shrunk considerably so that for those uh, that did follow the news more closely, that they had more of an opinion one way or the other. And usually that was proportional so that if someone approved or disapproved um, of a certain position, uh, you kind of saw that little gray box kind of be eaten on, on both sides for those that follow the news more closely. Um, we have a question uh, from the chat uh, from, from Jerry Kurzik. Uh, were you surprised that Korean pop culture is only reaching a niche market in the US? I thought it might be a bit broader than that. Um, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, if, and the, first off, like the music industry has changed a lot in the last couple of decades. Um, streaming and other things are now much more important. Um, so album sales aren't quite the same metric they would have been in the past. So, you know, it's somewhat hard to compare with prior eras. Um, but, you know, I had seen, for example, um, concert data um, from uh, a year or two before, and um, I think it was 2019. And the Spice Girls actually only toured the United Kingdom and earned more in terms of uh, revenue than any other act that year. And so clearly, you know, slightly different comparison because we're talking about something that only took place in the United Kingdom. But I think that, you know, one of the things when you look at the broader media market today from when they started out their careers and now when a lot of the Korean acts are coming to the United States is, you know, we had a much more sort of homogenous media market. Uh, you had cable TV and you had the broadcast networks, but you didn't have streaming services. You didn't have multiple outlets to where people could watch uh, niche and specialty things. And so I think if you look at the market structure now, it's almost designed to where, um, you know, it's difficult to reach a mass audience, you know, even broadcast TV. I remember when I was younger, you know, things like friends would get 40 million viewers a week uh, to where today, you know, shows struggle to get 10 million viewers a week and a lot of shows only average you know in their live broadcast at least so this gets topped up on streaming you know sometimes two or three million and so i think the media market today kind of means that um, there is going to be sort of a niche nature to a lot of this now you know you break out some of that but it's not surprising to me that you know you're seeing these lower numbers just because of different structures in the media market today yeah, to add a choice point to you, I, something I realized afterwards, it would have been useful to have some sort of, uh, to compare it to American media products. We didn't, we didn't have a comparable question asked there of some of the bigger American uh, pop cultural movies and artists that we could kind of compare it to, to see kind of what, what Troy's talking about, where um, how much of any particular demographic in America is aware of, of a certain pop cultural person. Um, and something else I realized too after the survey is that we survey specifically voting age American adults, 18 and above. And my assumption, and, and, I, and I think if, if we were to, to um, get people that were under 18, Gen Z and younger, my guess is that you'd have a lot more people that are aware of those K-pop and, and K-drama um, products than, than some of the, um, the older generations do. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I was also talking earlier on that in some way, some of these metrics may be lagging metrics in that We'll see this shift maybe in three, five years from now, but right now it's still, you know, sort of at this point. Yeah. So we have another question in uh, the chat that was kind of you know similar to to the question that was asked just now from Danny Kim. It says one of the more surprising findings was the low brand awareness as far as Korean products. Do you think this is a strategic decision by the respective companies and their advertising departments? Is it because nationally identifiable products are more susceptible to views, positive or negative, towards the country of origin? So I know from talking to different people who've worked in uh, the consulting industry um, and just you know my own you know, viewing of Samsung's commercials that Samsung very much tries to make it uh, self be appear as an international company and not try to have a specific national origin in a lot of its advertising or anything. Um, you know, the auto industry tends to be a bit more nationalistic. And I think that's why, you know, there tends to be somewhat of a greater awareness of Hyundai and Kia as being uh, Korean brands. Uh, 
but I think in a broad sense, um, you don't see, unlike perhaps some countries, companies from other countries, a strong push by companies from uh, Korea to be identified as Korean. And maybe you'll remember specifically, I'm blanking at the moment, Juni, but there was one uh, Korean company that actually more people thought was Japanese than uh, Korean. Do you remember offhand which one it was, Juni? Yeah, I think it was Samsung. I'd, I'd have to double check. Yeah. So, and and, add, and add, to add to that too, it, it'd be interesting to see um, for some of these Korean companies, their, their strategy moving forward, because kind of like what Troy has mentioned, we're, we're just kind of hitting the peak of some of this um, kind of uh, uh, prevalence of, of, of Korean cultural products and kind of the idea of Korean cool and, and Korea being um, kind of the hotspot for a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of pop cultural attention and to see if uh, moving forward, if Korean companies try to write that in some way that, that they, they market their products as something that is innovative or creative or something that represents something positive for, for people. Yeah, and I think there is a symbiotic relationship here in that if you know more companies are known to be in seen as Korean and if Korea is seen as cool, you know, that can help their sales, but then identifying those products as Korean also then helps South Korea's broader soft power. So there is a little bit of a symbiotic relationship here to where with Korean companies for so long, not identifying as Korean, it's probably limited South Korea's soft power in the US to a degree. Great. So moving to a slightly different uh, sphere, we have another comment, uh, another question from the chat from Phil uh, Venditti. Um, a plurality of American respondents, if I understood your slides, believes that no country should have nuclear weapons. Is there any indication of how South Koreans might have answered the same question? I, I, I follow a little bit of Gallup Korea's own and Real and Real Meter. They're they're two um, Korea-based polling organizations, but I don't recall seeing one recently for uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Um, if they agree if the U.S. should have them or, or if South Korea should have them. I, I haven't seen anything recently. I haven't seen anything recently either. Um, I can't say when South Koreans are asked whether they should acquire nuclear weapons themselves, that number has been growing. But there are also, if you, and this once again gets back to sort of how you ask a question. If you ask questions that ask them, would you still agree to have nuclear weapons if it meant um, there would be economic costs to South Korea, such as sanctions? Um, those numbers tend to quickly fall back then. Uh, so my guess is, is that in a general sense, there's probably a view that nuclear weapons would be a positive thing for South Korea. And this is probably driven by the situation with North Korea. But if you actually get into the details and start laying out like what the costs might be, that tends to go away. Well, and the results d did surprise us, but um, there was another organization called Nuclear Ban that also worked with YouGov that did a similar question in 2019, and their results were similar. They, they got that 49% of Americans believe that um, no country should have uh, military, maintain their military nuclear capabilities. Yeah, actually, one thing that surprised us was that more Americans would rather North Korea have uh, nuclear weapons in Pakistan. Um, to be honest, that's within the margin of error, but it was still kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's an unusual response, not one I would have expected, that's for sure. So similarly, um, going on to uh, attitudes towards um, the attitudes in South Korea, uh, Richard Stevenson asks, are you aware of similar surveys of American attitudes about other Asian East Asian countries? And if so, how do they compare? Or if not, how do you think they would compare with your results on attitudes about the Koreans? So Pew does uh, surveys on in multiple countries in East Asia, um, I think every two years. Um, they ask questions such as, you know, what do you think of the United States? Um, I don't know if uh, I've seen a comparable though of asking Americans about other countries sort of in this detail. Um, the Chicago Council does sort of ask more broadly, you know, what do you think of the alliance with Japan? What do you think of the alliance with some other countries? Um, so there's a little bit of that in there. Um, 
but beyond that, I am unsure uh, if anybody else has done anything country specific to the extent that we have. Um, what would I expect? You know, if you kind of look at our survey and look at it as a proxy, um, there are certain allies the US or the American public seems to know better. Um, not surprising, you know, Canada, um, the United Kingdom. Uh, so I think, you know, if we did surveys uh, on those two countries, you'd probably get fairly strong results and everything and broad support for the relationships we have with them. Um, you know, I think the challenge would be when you start getting into, you know, countries to where Americans are more unsure. You know, I think if you look at the data on South Korea and when we asked, you know, do you view South Korea as a friend? You know, the fact that there was that really large onshore bar, what that tells me is that there's a large part of Americans who probably don't know a lot about South Korea. And what they do know only gives them a surface level opinion. Um, and so I think, you know, what that says to me more broadly is that there's still work for South Korea to do in the United States in terms of, you know, letting Americans know uh, what the alliance is about, uh, how we work together and how our relationship benefits uh, both countries. Yeah, to piggyback off that question a little bit, um, I know there's similar surveys that are conducted in South Korea in terms of the views of the United States. Um, how do you think the, the two countries compare in terms of your findings versus how um, South Koreans view the United States and how much South Koreans know about the United States? My personal instinct would be that South Koreans are much more aware of the you know, the United States and um, US policy, but uh, how, what, are, what are some things you've observed or have read on that? Yeah, that's a very good instinct and, and you are correct. And, and that was one thing that we thought about going into when we conceptualized this whole idea uh, was that it, there's an unbalanced amount of coverage, right? That's like here on the American side, and, uh, unless there's some sort of hop in issue that kind of presses South Korea towards the top uh, for most even casual observers of news, they're not gonna know a lot about South Korea. Um, but on the South Korean side, it, the US relationship with South Korea is huge, it's monumental. Um, so more, the average South Korean will know much more about the implications of the US-South Korea relationship than the other way around. Yeah, and do you think um, what, you know, if you, what have you seen in terms of, um, South Koreans' perceptions of the United States that you might be able to comment on for some of our participants today. In terms of answering similar questions as to what you've asked um, the American public. Yeah, so, and I'll give a few things I've seen and then Judy, you know, please add. Um, you know, if you ask about USFK, um, there tends to be very strong support for USFK. Um, if you ask about specific US leaders, that tends to fluctuate. Um, you know, when uh, President Trump came into office, he was less well liked than I think every leader that uh, South Koreans polled in Asia, as well other than uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, so I mean, I think even Abe was more popular than he was at the time. Now his engagement with uh, North Korea changed a little bit of that over time, but he never reached the popularity in South Korea that uh, President Obama had. Um, so I think. If you ask questions about like the alliance, there's strong support, you know, both for the troops staying and for their role there. Um, if you ask questions about, um, you know, U.S. leaders, you get more fluctuation. Um, I would be leery to ask, you know, the American public a question about, you know, their views on Park Geun-hye or Moon Jae-in or some other South Korean leader, because I think most would come back and say, we don't know. Um, but, you know, I think. There is some divergence and some overlap, uh, but Juni, do you have any other specific uh, ones you've seen? Yeah, I mean, the, the, like Troy had mentioned, it's it's you see a very similar percentage of people that do support um, the U.S.-Korea military alliance, U.S.-Korea economic ties, cultural ties. If you if you do get a little bit more nuanced and you kind of ask maybe some more politically sensitive issues regarding the relationship, you'll probably get more varying opinions. Uh, but similar to kind of our results, where like yes, there is some partisan divide in terms of uh, if you include looking at it from the administration perspective, like how is the administration doing, you'll get a more politically divisive response. But if you're asking about the broad question of, well, do you support the alliance between these two allies? Generally, the answer, most people in the 7 to 8% range or so 
uh, will will support it. Yeah, Junie reminded me of one thing. I haven't seen a poll in recent years on the Chorus FTA in South Korea, um, but in the few years after it and during the negotiations, there was always a majority of Koreans who were in favor. Um, so it was actually kind of interesting that um, in the legislative elections uh, back, back in about 2014 or so, uh, the Minju actually ran on uh, that if they won, they would uh, withdraw from the agreement. And it was somewhat perplexing because generally speaking, you don't run as a politician against something that's popular. Um, and you know, all I've ever really seen are surveys that usually put support for the FTA between about low 50s to mid 60 uh, percentage. Yeah. Um, so as people who work at the Korea Economic Institute, which has a mission of educating Americans about US Korea relations, um, were there any particular results that you are using or that you think could be helpful to shape your outreach and educational strategies going forward? So as I mentioned, I definitely think, you know, the fact that there is a knowledge gap, I think is one of the things that our survey shows is something that, you know, for us to look into, um, you know, right now with uh, COVID, you know, clearly we're not traveling. Uh, we still are doing, you know, events around the country. I did one uh, uh, in Nashville a couple weeks ago with the World Affairs Council there. Uh, one of my colleagues, Kyle Ferrier, was his today, Juni, uh, in Vermont. Um, so, that's, yeah. I think it's tomorrow. Oh, it's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but so, you know, we're trying to do these sort of still around the country and, you know, reach out to people. Um, I think, you know, beyond sort of the broader message, you know, one of the things that stands out to me is that, you know, there is a lot of uh, commonality on North Korea. And so I think really what that tells me is that it's not a question of really what Americans want to see happen in US policy towards North Korea, but it's really about talking with them about sort of how we try to get there and what we can do. And so I think there's probably scope for that. Um, and then on the South Korea side, you know, I really think you know part of it is just talking more about the economic relationship. Um, you know, while most Americans think that the economic relationship is beneficial, you know, I think in a difficult time like this where you know people are struggling, you know, I would actually be curious to see on that question if maybe the results go down after you've had a year of you know hard economic times in a lot of the country. Um, so I'll be curious to see about that and then. Know, sort of how we approach really maybe talking more about the economic relationship with people around the country. And, and to add to that, I mean, it's a, it's a question that we, you know, as our organization, we're always trying to promote understanding and, and the, the history of the U.S.-Korea alliance. Um, it's not as urgent now as it was underneath the previous administration that challenged some of the notions of, of the alliance. Um, but a lot of Americans, maybe don't know the full history of, of how, how deeply involved America was with the Korean War and rebuilding and helping uh, South Korea rebuild and, and how, how deep those ties go. Um, so it's, when you do have an issue that comes up for whatever reason of an administration or a certain politician wants to question the nature of the alliance and then if a lot of Americans aren't aware of certain issues regarding um, how, how deep that partnership is, then you know, we, we want to make sure that that type of situation doesn't happen so that a lot of Americans are aware of, of how much our, our common ties and values really bring us together. Yeah. We have another question from the chat. This is circling back to the to culture. Uh, what was the reason not to include America's awareness or appreciation of Korean food? I think that is a big part of the diffusion of Korean culture in the U.S. This is from Jerry Curzon. Um, we actually did, uh, we asked basically for awareness of kimchi and what was the other, uh, Juni? Uh, I actually have it pulled up right now. Let me, yeah, yeah. so yeah, we didn't include it in our, in our presentation, but we actually, it, it was, it was something that we thought about too, because we realized that food is a big part of, yeah, uh, I read the report and, and, and saw the, saw Marmite as a category and thought that was, oh yeah. So yeah, so um, we, we did do this. We just apologize. We edited things down tonight. You, so if you go to our website, you can see some additional data that we didn't discuss tonight. Um, but um, kimchi actually, you know, 50% of Americans are aware of kimchi and of those, you know, people know it's Korean. Uh, 
So this is one area where you do see some breakthrough. Um, not many Americans know about bibimbap, but those who do know about it seem to actually know where it is from. Um, but yeah, um, we wanted to put in some things that we um, knew would be foods that Americans would recognize to give some kind of context. Uh, but then I also wanted to go for something that I figured might be obscure. So that's kind of how Marmite got in there. Yeah, uh, I appreciated seeing Marmite. Um, then, so one thing I thought about too, um, in terms of North Korea, which we haven't talked a lot about North Korea, uh, I thought it was really interesting that so many, that over half of Americans or just about half actually approve of sending humanitarian assistance to North Korea. Um, that is something that I haven't seen talked about very much in the news recently. In, um, in terms of um, for future North Korea policy, do you see that uh, as, a, as a potential um, policy, action, policy um, action that can be taken to, uh, in times of you know, fairly high tension with, with North Korea as, a, as is uh, now? So I have seen that during the transition period, Kurt Campbell gave an interview to where he said that we should be looking at um, humanitarian aid. Uh, I haven't seen much beyond that. And while he is the Asia policy czar, um, you know, that job is largely about coordinating in relations to China. Uh, I'm sure he has an interest in North Korea, but I'm not sure how much, you know, he's going to deal with that. In terms of policy direction, you know, one of the things that I think um, we should be looking at more is not just the humanitarian aid, but you know, addressing the human rights situation. You know, this is something that Americans feel strongly about. Um, we tend to facil facilitate on that, uh, you know, depending on who's in office or what their objectives are. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, part of reaching a better understanding with North Korea is going to be talking to them about these hard issues as well. Um, and so there's two sort of perspectives on this. You know, when I talk to some of my colleagues in South Korea, um, they tend to view human rights as, you know, food aid and things that would take and allow North Koreans, even under the current regime as it is, to hopefully live better lives. Um, we tend to view it more in sort of a rights perspective. Um, but in a general sense, one thing that we need to address is because I think there's an interest, even though we have different perspectives in trying to do something to improve the situation in North Korea, is make sure that the groups who are able to work in North Korea are able to do the jobs they can. And so this means we need to be sort of constantly looking at the UN sanctions and finding out where, you know, perhaps they're hindering either medical aid or food aid going into North Korea, because the intent of sanctions was never to take and, you know, hurt the population. It was to take and put pressure on the regime. And I, I know people who are in DC who are very, very skeptical of North Korea and very um, sort of strong on sanctions, but even they would say that, you know, that's not the goal of sanctions. And so I do think there's work we can do there, but I think the challenge is, is even if you look at, for example, when we took sanctions off Iran before um, the Trump administration under Obama, even once the sanctions left, you still had a lot of financial institutions who didn't want to deal with Iran because uh, Iran had a stigma as being a place that you shouldn't do business with. And so I think even when we try to proactively work with North Korea, there's going to be on the private side this reluctance to take and finance humanitarian groups doing work with North Korea because their concern is going to be that they're going to get caught up later in some kind of North Korean financial scandal. So I do think it's going to be a challenge going forward to address that though. Yeah, definitely. So we have about four minutes left and um, I guess as a final question to wrap up uh, our webinar, we have a question from Brent uh, Burkholder. Um, what do you think are implications of your findings for members of the Friends of Korea who are committed to furthering South Korea-American links? Well, kind of like what Troy had mentioned, um, you know, it, sometimes we take for granted like, oh, okay, like, you know, South Korea has made it to the mountaintop in terms of uh, pushing some of the soft power cultural uh, diffusion. Um, but based on our survey results, that doesn't seem to be the case that there's still kind of a low awareness of certain uh, South Korea as a as a political actor, or South Korea as a, as a deep well of cultural and historical knowledge, uh, there's still a lot of unawareness, just discaps of knowledge. And um, 
and I think for kind of our, for our own mission too, is something that uh, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of kind of decreasing some of those knowledge gaps and, and uh, making more Americans aware of our, the, the two nations ties and, and, the, and the good things that we can do uh, with working together. All right. Um, so do you have any final, final comments um, for our audience? No, I would just like to say thanks for everybody for coming and having us come to talk about this. Um, you know, we, in addition to the second annual survey, we're hoping to do a couple other smaller ones uh, this year, looking at uh, North Korea and South Korea individually. So, you know, please uh, do look out for those, uh, you know, some point uh, coming forward. And um, at the end of the day, if you have any questions uh, for us that you didn't get a chance to ask tonight, or, um, you know, if, like I said, we have additional uh, data on our website, um, please feel free to go there to reach out to us and we'd be happy to try and uh, see what we can get for you. And thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, I just shared the link. So if anyone is interested, please feel free to go there. And, and yeah, we're, we're excited to keep working on this project and, uh, and do future iterations as well. All right, um, thank you so much for, for, uh, for sharing your findings with us and for speaking with us. And uh, we hope we have a chance to work with you again soon on uh, some of your other projects. So thank you so much and um, we hope to see you again soon.